Praise the Lord. David said, and I rejoiced when they said, let's go to the house of the word, the Lord and praise Him and worship Him. It's good to be with you this morning. <coughs> Everyone out. Good to see you all out this morning. Turn to your turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. John chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. It says in the scripture, we know this, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. There's not a person in here and themselves are righteous. We are full of unrighteousness. It says in the scriptures that our, our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. And we have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 to see why that is. When we read about the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. And, and I think we, a lot of times we have a real difficult time really trying to really comprehend it. You're trying to understand what that, is, what that fall was really all about. Happened so long ago, but the great gulf that was created between man and God because of that sin of Adam and Eve, that we have all inherited that. And because of that inheritance, because of that, that in and of ourselves, we have no salvation. There's nothing I can do, there's nothing you can do. All the good stuff that we can do and all the good things that you do, it's still, in the sight of God, is filthy rags. Because you have no righteousness within you, and I have no righteousness within me. There's no one out there can, who, that can earn their own salvation. Not a person. Not a person. So we're going to take a look at this a little bit this morning. We're going to deviate from what we've been doing over the last um, uh, month in, in, in our series of building the wall, and I want you to turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 16, and go down through verse 21. I have a lot of scripture for you this morning, okay, because I want you to ponder on some things and think on some things today. So John chapter 3, 16 to 21, for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you this morning, thanking you, Lord, for your word spoken to us through the pages of our Bible. And Lord God, we pray and ask the penetration of our hearts today. And Lord God, the decision that each and every person must make individually, whether to accept what is written in your word, or to reject the only begotten Son. So speak to us this morning, Lord God. Open our hearts to be receptive to your word. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. For God did so love the world, didn't he? That that through all the animal sacrifices that we read way back here in the book, and all the things that people have instilled over those years to, to try to bring man closer to God, or to try to make up for the sins that they would commit, that they would annually bring sacrifices to the temple. But those sacrifices, if you read the book of Hebrews, really didn't do what, they, what the people thought that they would do. There was still that separation between God and man. And so God had that great plan way before the foundations of the earth that he had to do something himself to be able to bridge that gap, that gulf between him and us because that sin of Adam and Eve and the sins that we commit are just so great. And so that decision was made as we read in John 3.16, 
Because of His great love for us. I cannot fathom that love. You can't fathom that love. I have no idea of that kind of love that the decision was made for Him to send His only begotten Son, Jesus, to this earth to go to the cross at Calvary, to be nailed to that cross, to die an excruciating death for my sins. I don't understand it. I don't think there's a person in here that fully comprehends what was done for you and me at the cross of Calvary. What was done for all of mankind at the cross of Calvary. I don't get it. I don't get it. But His love for us is so great that He did that for us. <coughs> Jesus didn't come into this world, as it says in the Scripture. He didn't come into this world to condemn us. And certainly He could have done that. Because of all the sins, He could have come and condemned us and sent us straight to hell. You and I, this, that very day, we are deserving of hell for the, for the transgressions of our life. But God is merciful, full of compassion, full of love, full of grace. And it's by His grace that we are saved through our faith in Him. And it's not of our works, anything that we do. So it's not of all the sacrifices you can make. You know, we read in the Scriptures where, where, where for example, David, after he, had a, uh, 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 after he conquered a people, he would have thousands of sacrifices praising God to give those to God but that wasn't enough. We just simply have to accept what was done for us on Calvary. He didn't come to condemn us. He didn't come to send us to hell. He came here to this earth to save us through Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. It says, whoever believes in Him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, Jesus came into this world. He was the light of the world. He came in this world, but the world, because of our evilness, because of the things that people do, we don't accept that light. People would not accept the light when He came in 2,000 years ago. They wouldn't accept it. But for those who did accept it, and there were that group that did accept it, and there's this group today that does accept it. It's all to the salvation of their souls. The light of the world. And we are called to be a reflection of God in this world. To lead other people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was about to go to the cross at Calvary and he's sitting down with his disciples in what we refer to the Last Supper. And he's sitting, he's sitting with them and he, he told them, he says, in, in, in John chapter 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions or in my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you so that where I am you may be also. I'll come back for you and you'll come back and be with me. That you will be with me also. In my Father's house. Being in the presence of God Almighty for all of eternity. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. So that where I am, you can be with me also. Now my question to you right now is where do you want to spend your eternity? We're talking just before, well, you know, before church started today. None of us are going to die. In our, we may die in this physical body, but our soul's going to live forever. And where do you want to spend that eternity? And see, the choice is going to be yours. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father but by me. He is the only way. So many other religions or so many other people think that there's so many other ways to get to the Father, to get to heaven. But Jesus made it very clear that it's only through Him. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me, He said. Now you've got to believe that in your heart. 
You've got to really, really believe that. That Jesus is the only way to be with the Father in heaven. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It says in the book of Acts, it says, uh, Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Meaning that Jesus is the only way. He is the only way. It's found in no one else. Nothing else but Jesus. Remember when Paul and Silas were in that Philippian jail? We've talked about that a couple times with them last month. Paul and Silas were in the Philippian jail and they were praying and they were singing and we all know what story to happen but the jailer comes in after the giant earthquake and he, and he thought all the prisoners fled and he asked the question that we ourselves either in our heart or audibly ask that people today have to ask what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? They simply told him, believe in your heart. That Jesus is the Lord, and I'll be saved. In Romans chapter 10, it says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved, for it's with your heart that you believe, and with your mouth that you confess. That you confess. You who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, have you confessed Him? Have you stood before others publicly? Or have you been one-on-one -on -one with someone and confessed Jesus as Lord? Or is that a secret in your life? See, as a Christian, we are called <coughs> to confess Jesus as Lord and really to believe, believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. Do you truly believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? You do that, and you'll be saved. So I'm going to give you a choice in our time remaining today. <coughs> a multiple choice. Louise, you get to choose. You get to choose. Just a simple. I'm not going to ask you the question except do you want A or B? A? A. Let's talk about heaven for a second, shall we? Let's look, let's, let's, let's look at heaven. My question is then, is what will it be like to be in the presence of God Almighty for all of eternity? What's that going to be like? I have some scriptures for you. Okay? Have a pen, pencil, take note. Here we go. It says in Revelation 21, Revelation 21, verses 4 to 7. To be in the presence of God, it says, He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the older things has passed away. It says He'll wipe away every tear. Isn't that good news? The tears, the tears of hurt, the tears of suffering, the tears of pain, Whatever tears may be abounding in your life, things that cause sorrow or heartache, it says that Jesus himself will wipe away those tears. And there won't be any more death, and there won't be any more mourning, and there won't be any more crying, there won't be any more pain. There won't be any more cancer. There won't be any more heart disease. There won't be any more Parkinson's. There won't be any more ALS. Oh, that's going to be gone. There won't be any more doctor's appointments. There won't be any more medications. When we get to heaven. No more doctors. No more nurses. No more hurts. No more pain. No more struggles. No more hurts in heaven. It's good news. He says that he makes everything new. He says that to the thirsty I'll give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. To those who are victorious, they will inherit this. He said, I'll be their God, and they will be my children. That's from, taken from Revelation 21, 4 to 7. I paraphrased some in there. But then a little bit further in that chapter, just a couple of verses down the road, he talks about the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Okay? He talks about this place called the New Jerusalem. And he gives this description. 
okay, about the New Jerusalem, beginning in verse 10. I want you to go back and read all the scripture yourself because I'm not going to this morning. But it says, it says, it shone with the glory of God and His brilliance was like a very precious jewel, like a jasper, it says, clear as crystal. It had great high walls and twelve gates and the twelve angels at the gates. And the gates uh, were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on each side, all right? Three gates on each side. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the angel came and measured this great city, this new Jerusalem that came down out of heaven. He measured it with a golden rod, and it says the city was laid out like a square as long as it was high. It found it to be 12,000 stadia. That really doesn't mean anything to me, 12,000 stadia, but it's 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles high. Okay, And the measuring uh, for the, the thickness was 144 cubits. Again, that means nothing to me, but that's 220 feet thick. All right. The wall was made of jasper, the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, then sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx, ruby, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, turquoise, jacinth, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. And the street was pure gold, as pure as transparent glass. That's the New Jerusalem giving a description there. It says the Lord all God, uh, Almighty and the Lamb are the, its temple, because there's no temple there. They are the temple. Uh, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. There's no night there, it says in the Scripture. Nothing impure will ever enter this city. Nothing shameful or deceitful will enter the New Jerusalem. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your, is your name in the book? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, is your name in the Book of Life, the Lamb's Book of Life this very day. In Revelation 7, write it down, Revelation 7. It says, in Revelation 7, beginning in verse 16, it says, Never again will there be any hunger, no thirst. The sun will not beat down on you, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb is at the center of the throne, and He will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So church, that, that is good news. That gives us something. You know, and, 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 and so I, I don't, you know, we, we read and we hear, and we've seen movies of people who have died and have been in the presence of God. We know that in the book of Revelation, John himself was in the presence of Okay? We, know that, we know that the Apostle Paul had that glimpse of the third heaven. And we know of people who have died and say, come, you know, gone to heaven to come back and try to describe it. Can't do it. Cannot do it. But then comes the B. You chose A. Let's look at B quickly. Okay? So obviously, if A talks about heaven, Let's turn the corner for a second, shall we? And let's look at the B, okay? Because what's going to be like to be separated from the very presence of God? Let's look at that. Jesus said that those who reject the salvation of God will be cast into outer darkness. We've read that in Scripture. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, okay? Uh, torment in there. But let's look at some Scripture here. In Revelation 21 again, see, Revelation, focus on that chapter. Focus on that chapter. It says, but... The, but the unbelieving, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic art, and the adulterers and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Hmm. That's the second death. In chapter 14, verse 11, it says, And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, for anyone who receives the mark of its name. The torment of being cast into outer darkness, into the into the lake of burning sulfur, the lake of fire, to be removed from the presence of God. Second Thessalonians 1 9 says, They will be punished with an everlasting destruction. 
and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Matthew 25, 41. Then He will also say to those on His left, Depart from Me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark 47, 48. And if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into hell, where their worm uh, does not die and the fire is not quenched. Your choice. We all have that choice. I cannot make the choice for my children. My children cannot make the choice for their children. My mom and dad could not make the choice for me. It's my choice whether I want to take A or B. Whether I want to spend all of eternity in the presence of God Almighty where He'll wipe away the tears. Where, he'll, where, he, where, where I have no more hurts and no more sorrow and no more heartache. All those things would be gone. Where I can spend separation from God. I'm given that choice. You are too. And Joshua, back in the Old Testament, at the very end of his book, he's gathering all the elders of Israel around him because it's time for him to depart from this world. And so he's talking to them. We don't know everything that he said, but we know he said this, he said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Whether it's the gods over here that, you, that were served over when you were on the other side. You can serve them. You can follow their ways and His ways. And, and, and you can do all the evil. He says, but for me, for me, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Make, make, a make, a decision, make a choice. Make a choice. A or B. A or B. It's that simple. It's my desire today that you choose A. That you want to spend all of eternity in the presence of God. And if you do not know Jesus, as your Lord and Savior. If John 3.16 are just words written on a page to you, you may know those words. If they're just words written on a page, the altar is open today for you to come and give your life to Jesus Christ and say, I'm sorry, Lord God, for my sins. I accept what Jesus did to cross at Calvary for my sins. I want to spend all of eternity in His presence. I want to spend all of eternity with the Father in Heaven. If that is, this, is, that is, if that is what's weighing on you today, this is open right now to come and pray. I will pray with you. If you look at your life over the past Six months, nine months, 12 months, 15 months, two years, three years, five years, 10, 20 years. And maybe you had that zeal at one time for God. You were a zealot. And things have just kind of fizzled in your life because of the cares of the world. And you want to recommit or rededicate your life to the Lord. This altar is open. If you just have a heavy burden on your heart today that you need to present at the foot of the cross to Jesus, this is open. And I just want to encourage you today, don't walk out those doors without making that decision. It is that important. This is the one thing I can guarantee you of is the fact that you are not guaranteed to make it home today. There's no guarantee. There isn't. 
It may be your time. It's that serious. You may not be given this evening, tonight, or tomorrow. The only thing you're guaranteed is the very second you're in right now. So with that, I'm going to shut up because seconds are valuable. And as we close, this altar is open for you to come. Lord God, we thank you for this morning and your word. And I pray, Lord God, for anyone here who does not know you as their Savior and Lord, Father, through your Holy Spirit and the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray and ask, Lord God, that, 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 that your Spirit pulls them up the, uh, up the aisle, Lord. And if there's anyone here, Lord God, this morning who just wants to rededicate their life to you, Lord God, I, I, we just give it to you. And if there's anyone with a heavy burden on their heart, Lord God, your altar's open. May your Holy Spirit move. In the name of Jesus.